Once again, I'd just like to say thank you all for being here. Super thrilled uh, to have such a great turnout on short notice. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Stuart. Um, many of you know him uh, through his amazing publication and long, uh, long time journalistic prowess here in San Francisco, running Broadcast Stuart. Um, he's a San Francisco native. He's a community advocate and he's a longtime friend of Glide. So really, really proud to have him here taking us the rest of the way in this conversation. Um, so Stuart, I'll pass it over to you. Hi, everybody. Hi, um, I'm excited to be here. One quick note, I'm actually not a San Francisco native, uh, but I've been here for like almost 20 years. So most of my adult life or almost all of my adult life. So it's definitely a local. Um, I'm excited to be here. I love Glide, um, and when you when I was reached out to, and basically I would do anything for Glide because uh, I believe in what, what they do so much. If I believed in God, which I don't really do, uh, I would believe in Glide's kind of God, the one that is, um, you know, just all love and unconditional. Because I mean, especially now in this particular crazy, awful moment, uh, that's what we need more than anything is unconditional love. And so, um, yeah, anytime Glide reaches out, I'm like, yep, I'm there. Um, it's, it's, I'm really excited to also um, interact with some of these great people doing awesome things in these organizations. So I don't want to talk too much because I could talk forever. Uh, so uh, I'm going to throw to um, to John Carpentier from uh, he's the engagement lead at Glide and, and let him go. Let's hear it for John. Thanks, Stuart. I'm loving all the uh, different Bay Area bridges in the background. We got Chris with Golden Gate and Stuart's got the Bay over there. So we got the full cross from screen to screen. Um, I just want to echo the sentiments that everybody else offered. Um, there's so there's so much that can draw your attention right now, ironically, because we're all stuck at home. Um, and I always like to call it feeling zoomed out at the end of a day where you've been on too many video calls or just consuming too much media by your screen. So we really appreciate you keeping the stamina going and learning a little bit about Glide as well as the bevy of incredible organizations that you have in front of you today. Um, so for those of you who may not be as familiar with the background, Glide is one of the oldest and largest organizations serving the homeless population in San Francisco. In an average day, our daily free meals program, our best known program, will serve just over 2,000 individuals, um, which is a pretty incredible number, and yet, scarily enough, in San Francisco is really just scratching the surface of the need that's out there. If you want to look at the official count, um, meaning the number of homeless individuals who have been properly recorded, you'll see that number to be somewhere between 8,000 and 9,000. But if you pool the knowledge of on the ground organizations, many of us actually estimate that that number is closer to 25,000 individuals without any kind of permanent housing in San Francisco proper, which is an unbelievable percentage of a city's population of about 830,000 people. In that normal day in the normal world in which we would normally live, those 2,000 meals a day are made possible by 85 volunteers each and every single day that we operate. And then over the course of a year, because our folks keep that kitchen open 364 days a year, that means that we will be bringing in over 30,000 volunteers to serve those meals to our community, not counting all of the special holiday events or one-off meals that Glide is doing throughout the year and especially at the end of the year. For that service, we obviously do it in our main dining hall, which can accommodate about 70 to 75 individuals at any given time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner like clockwork every single day. So you can imagine that as COVID hits, that's one of the first things that was made entirely impossible by any of the restrictions that each and every one of us have to follow. The good news is for what Glide is doing is that we're reaching uh, in the first week the same number of clients that we would at an average time now during COVID. And the especially good news is through the incredible support that we've gotten from individuals, from institutions, from community partners, Glide is now actually during COVID serving more clients than we would in an average week because the need is commensurately greater. Uh, through a number of in-kind donations, as well as the support that I mentioned before, we're now putting out about 15,000 meals just in direct deliveries at Glide. What that takes the form of now is using the street in front of our main building as sort of a landing pad uh, to see each and every one of our clients trying to enforce the six foot rule as best as we can with all staff covered in PPE, as well as kind of a, a makeshift uh, shelter like you might see at the grocery store um, as kind of a sneeze guard and contact guard. 
those 15,000 meals are at the glide standard, which is another great thing, especially now where there's a fresh protein, fresh starch, fresh fruit, and fresh vegetable, as well as as much fresh water as we can give out to each and every client who passes through that line. But Glide is not the only organization in need. And while we are fortunate enough to be self-sustaining during this time with the support of our community, many others aren't. And so we've been able, probably what I would say is our greatest accomplishment during this time to funnel a lot of the support that we've gotten into other organizations who are struggling to an even higher degree during this unprecedented time. So in addition to the 15,000 meals that we're giving out directly, we're now providing nearly 10,000 additional meals all over the community in San Francisco, in the Tenderloin, in the Mission, Bayview, Chinatown, Embarcadero, all over the place, really trying to lift up each and every person that we possibly can right now. It's, I think, difficult for those of us on the more privileged side of society to sometimes empathize with, but this issue, this global pandemic that many of us see as a casual threat or, or in some cases simply an inconvenience is for our clients, for the homeless and transient of San Francisco, potentially a lethal threat, something that is very difficult to manage without any kind of regular access to hygiene, without simple access to PPE, and the inability to stay healthy or meet your body's basic nutritional needs. Uh, one of the first victims of COVID really was the city's homeless shelter system. Many of those shelters closed down almost instantly, and we've been scrambling ever since, those of us who are, are advocates and, and passionate partners of this community to find options. We're in the middle of advocating for a number of solutions in large places of congregation in hotels to provide, um, if not permanent, as stable housing as we possibly can for this population. But there are, of course, many challenges for it. And that's one of the areas in which we need the support of individuals like you. Um, while uh, dollars and in-kind donations are always going to go the farthest for organizations like Glide and, and so many of the wonderful nonprofits in the city, one of the best things that everyone can do is just signal boost the wonderful things that you'll be hearing today. Um, some of the basic facts and figures, but also just getting rid of some of the stigma, some of the incorrectly held beliefs about the homeless community, about what they're experiencing and the needs that they have right now. Um, with an issue like this, we're all stronger together. Um, it's a biological term being herd immunity, but I think it's true psychologically as well is that the more safe that everyone feels and the healthier that everyone is right now, the better the city is going to be and the higher it's going to be held up. And that's extremely important, more so now than ever. As our final offerings, uh, I'm also glad to report that Glide is continuing to give out hygiene products to the community. Um, that's another really wonderful thing that you can support right now, uh, be it hand sanitizer, be it wipes, clean water, blankets, um, access to public works restroom, whatever the case may be. We're now giving out uh, just over 750 hygiene products each and every single day that we operate. Again, made almost entirely possible by new or unprecedented support that we wouldn't normally be receiving at such an exponential level. Um, in addition to our Family Youth and Child Care Center, which is operating, if not physically, uh, in many ways digitally or remotely, just as you might see uh, through the Unified School District or any uh, school that's operating, struggling to operate right now. The best thing that we can ask as a final note out the door right now, like I'm saying, um, is to take everything that you learned today, uh, be it new, be it something you already knew, but maybe haven't advocated for uh, quite as much as is possible right now and encourage individuals to learn more, if nothing else. You know, it's impossible to show up in person and support many of these organizations right now, but your voice is more powerful than ever. Many individuals are looking, this is kind of a wake up moment for places that they can support, for ways to lift up their friends and their neighbors. So I can't thank you enough, uh, echoing the sentiments again of everyone else for showing up today, for being present and for taking the time to learn about all of us. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, does anybody have any questions for John? No, none. Uh, okay. Um, it was said in the chat, but I'll, I'll say this out loud. If you have any, if you have any questions throughout this, just you can message me through the chat, and then uh, we can address the questions uh, when the time works out. Uh, cool. So now we're going to move on to um, our next awesome presenter, which is Lenore Estrada, who is the founder of SF New, New Deal. Hi, Lenore. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, so excited to be here today. 
Uh, our organization is called SF New Deal, and we've been around for about a month. Um, our one month anniversary passed last week. Um, we, I'm actually a small business owner. I own a business called Three Babes. We make pies. And about six weeks ago, we laid off 20 of our 26 staff members. Um, most of the business we were doing was selling to companies in various ways. So corporate dining programs, um, you know, office celebrations. And so when all the companies started working from home, we realized that we were going to have almost no revenue for several months. Um, so we immediately had to lay people off, which was terrible. Um, like many restaurants, a lot of our employees um, are only Spanish speaking or um, cannot apply for benefits because of um, their immigration status. Um, and so it was really devastating for us. Um, and we fortunately had a friend reach out who said he wanted to make a big commitment to trying to help other small businesses. Um, and so we launched this program to buy food from restaurants and deliver them to some of the most vulnerable people in San Francisco. Um, so we're partnering with over 14 community organizations at this point, um, an amazing group of black churches, um, 18 churches whose ministers and volunteers are um, already very well adept at getting resources out into the community. We're partnering with UCSF's um, Division of Citywide Case Management. So these are caseworkers, over 100 of them, who go out into the community and serve people living in SROs or um, people who are homeless and give them medication and care and food at this point. Um, and we're working with a number of other community organizations at this point. So for us, the key has really been partnering with people who were already doing this work because they're the ones that have many decades of experience and relationships um, and they sort of know where the need is and can get resources to people. Um, we are, we're paying restaurants 10 bucks a meal, um, which isn't, you know, the cheapest that we could be getting food, but really is like the price point at which it, it kind of works for the restaurants to have any money to pay staff. Um, we found that participating restaurants are able to keep, on average, half of their staff, um, and, you know, they're providing benefits, and, and we're sort of wanting to give stability to the people who are participating so that they can plan to keep their staff on. Um, for, for me, as a food business owner, um, we've definitely struggled in the past with challenges of spiky demand. So getting, like, no orders and then getting 300 orders one day and then getting no orders again doesn't really help you to plan for being able to continue employing anyone. And so we wanted to give people that security. Um, the first week, gosh, we, we delivered 100 meals the first day um, to citywide case management. And that first week we did 1,000 meals. The second week we did 18,000 meals. The third week we did 23,000 meals. Last week we did around 29,000 meals. Um, in, in the first month of operation, we did almost 100,000 meals and um, dispersed a, over a million dollars um, back into the community. Um, I think like a lot of organizations, we're struggling with funding. FEMA and the state of California have sort of announced programs to help pay for getting meals to people who are um, elderly, who have pre-existing conditions, and these are a lot of the groups that we're serving. Um, but Unfortunately, just like with the PPP money, um, the actual cash is sort of very slow to trickle down and hit the people who need it to make services happen. So um, a lot of us who are working in this space are kind of feeling this. Um, of the 43 businesses who are participating with us, only three of them have gotten approved for PPP funding. None of them, as far as I know, have actually gotten any money yet. Um, as far as I know, like none of the money from the Give to SF fund, for instance, has has reached any of the um, any of the small businesses that I know. Um, so, yeah, we're really here to just uh, support our small business community. A lot of people, unfortunately, who are losing their jobs, including some of my workers, even have become food insecure as a result of losing employment. So we're finding ways to support them by getting them free meals or um, food boxes. Um, but the key is really to meet them where they are. For most of the people we are serving, um, we are trying to do our best to do home deliveries um, or employ networks of volunteers who have existing relationships to deliver to people's houses because we don't want them to go outside. Um, we've also been working with a number of organizations, including um, RISE, which works with people who have recently been released from detention centers and oftentimes, um, just like the people Glide is serving, have no access to hygiene products, have no access to food. And so some of the work we're doing is just like pairing people who are coming across 
our inbox with like resources that we know about, even if we can't directly provide support, we sort of hear about other, <laughs> other resources and can really quickly connect people. Um, so the key for us was just to act. Um, I knew as, I, I don't know, I, I didn't have like a lot of faith that aid was gonna come really quickly <laughs> from the government. And so for me, the key was just like getting people money immediately because it's much easier to help someone who is like, kind of barely staying afloat, just like get across the line and bridge them to when they can get more support than it is to try to bring back a business that is entirely closed, whose workers have entirely dispersed and um, to whom kind of worse things have already begun happening. Um, the city of San Francisco has been pretty focused on serving COVID positive people for the last six weeks. Um, and only kind of over the course of the last week um, have they shown more support for feeding people who are um, not COVID positive, but who are at high risk and typically would have the worst health, health outcomes. Um, a lot of times these are communities of color, people who have hypertension, um, diabetes, who are elderly. Um, and with the exception of the Human Rights Commission, they've, they've shown early leadership in trying to find ways to get um, food to people who are living in public housing. And so we were working with them on, on getting those meals delivered. Um, but by and large, unfortunately, like the city government I think our city workers have been working very hard <laughs> to try to solve like all the many problems, which I think we're mostly all familiar with here. Um, but like finding housing for people, getting food, um, you know, dealing with public transportation and contagion issues, all these things. And, and so I think um, it's been sort of slow to respond in some of the ways that are like very desperately needed. So for, for us, the key is, is just like acting quickly to both like provide food and um, provide relief to our, to our businesses. Awesome, <laughs> thank you for that. presenting. Does anybody have any questions? No? All right, I bet you they'll all come up later. <laughs> yeah, everybody's gonna wanna talk at the very end. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, next we have, coming up we have, Teresa Goins, I uh, hope I said that right. I'm sorry, Teresa, if not. Uh, she's the founder of Old School Cafe. Awesome. Thanks so much for, for having me. Um, putting my little timer on because uh, I don't trust my sense of time here. <laughs> um, thanks so much for uh, allowing us to, I love um, hearing about the work you guys are doing, by the way. Um, some of our youth have benefited, for, I think, from some of those meals. So, um, so Old School Cafe is a youth-run jazz supper club. It's a nonprofit, and so we serve youth that are coming out of um, jail, foster care, other at-risk situations. Um, they're ages 16 to 22, and we're located in the Bayview Hunters Point. Um, so we, our model is a little um, special for this situation because we're a restaurant <laughs> and our model is all about employment of um, youth that would otherwise be unemployable. Um, so we do training and employment. So we have a huge workforce. So imagine, you know, if you think about, you know, with any business, your whole point is to try to have very efficient, <laughs> keep your workforce, uh, those numbers low. Um, and we are trying to hire more because we want, we know that um, it's really hard to just um, have training programs with no actual employment. Um, for youth to be able to move on and get employment if they actually, you know, don't have a resume with any true experience. So, um, so we have youth that most of them, it's their first job, their first legal um, job. And, um, and so it's been really important for us. Um, so the youth run all aspects of our jazz supper club. So they're the hosts, the servers, the chefs, the entertainment. Uh, we teach them the marketing, all aspects of what it takes to run the restaurant these young people are doing. Um, and so for us, um, being hit with the COVID epidemic of it, you know, um, shutting the restaurant down, it's also, um, you know, old schools become a real safe haven. It's that place of um, connecting for a lot of our youth that don't have um, a lot of support or um, just the overall, like, um, mentorship, um, the somebody to talk to, a safe place to go, they would also be losing that as well as their wages. Um, and we don't want them to go back to the streets in the ways that they know they can make money um, that are going to land them back in jail. And so 
uh, we were trying to quickly pivot to figure out how can we, um, with the restaurant closing, how do we continue to stay connected to them um, as well as make sure they're still able to earn some revenue. So we are doing three workshops a day for them via Zoom. So you have to picture um, teenagers that have never used Zoom before. Um, mm, I think that was my favorite part, like watching all of them like this and they're saying stuff and doing things. We're like, um, you know, we can hear you, right? <laughs> so it's been, um, you know, I think a lot of really great blessings in the middle of it is they're learning now great um, skills that are going to be helpful in the, in the workplace in the future. Um, and so they're getting a front of the house, a back of the house, a life skills workshop every day, and they're paid for every time they attend. Um, they're also getting, we provide um, wraparound support. So a lot of our youth end up um, homeless or um, have abuse, a lot of other challenges going on in their home. And so um, this way they get to meet with their coach still once a week via Zoom um, and make sure that, you know, do you guys have enough food what's the safety factor in the home right now? Um, like we just had a young, one of our young ladies just became homeless because she was kicked out. And so being able to stay connected to them during this time has been really important. And so they know, hey, um, there's people that are checking in every day with me, I'm getting paid. And if anything is happening, as we know, during this time, there's a lot of stress. And so when there's a lot of stress, that's when some of the violence goes up. And so just that regular connection has been really key. So yeah, so we've been doing um, some online fundraisers um, to try to figure out different ways that we can continue to make sure all of our youth are paid during this time that we're trying to keep our coaches employed and um, our chefs and our uh, restaurant staff that are the trainers and the mentors employed so they can continue to provide this training. Um, and then this is our first week we're going to try curbside pickup. Um, so we're, you know, working out where we bring about three youth in at a time and to keep the distancing. And um, so we'll see, we're doing an order, order ahead. Um, so we'll see what the demand is. If that, um, if that's successful, we'll hopefully be able to do more days. And um, that's allowing us to, again, that more connection with the youth, keeping them paid, uh, keeping them supported and um, keeping old school here for when, um, you know, when we reopen, we serve about 40 young people a year um, and we do three cohorts a year um, and we teach them everything, you know, from, like I said, front of the house, back of the house, they're learning a little bit of everything. And um, yeah, so we're just, you know, it's been a definitely a challenging season, but we're seeing a lot of um, the blessings that are hidden in the middle of that. And our youth are growing and learning all different types of things. Um, we're getting a chance to um, do some deeper trainings that sometimes when the restaurant's bustling and busy, you don't have a chance to do. So, so we're super grateful. Thank you, Eden. Uh, okay. I'd love to, any questions? I don't know if anybody's familiar with Old School Cafe or not, but... Um, yeah, we got a couple questions in here for you. Thank you so much. By the way, I love Old School Cafe. My fiance used to live right by you all, so we used to go in there once in a while. It's awesome. Thank you. Um, so we got a couple uh, questions from the group here. The first one's from Chris Dowd. Uh, the question is, how do you help the kids get other jobs beyond the cafe, assuming they develop awesome skills working for you, and do you help uh, further with further placement? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, yeah, so we do, um, it's a 12 week intensive 101 um, training program with us. And then we actually hire them if they graduate that and they can stay up to two years with us. And during that two years, um, we also do externship programs with other restaurant partners. So Bon Appetit um, and Michael Mina are two of our main partners um, that take youth on to do an externship and then often we'll offer empl uh, employment to them after. Um, so yes, they um, one actually became um, a manager at um, Bon Appetit at the Chase Center um, and got to start at 25 an hour as a supervisor there. So that was really exciting. Um, uh, yeah, so obviously that's it. We, had a, we have a kiosk in the Chase Center. So that was also uh, a <laughs> hard thing because that's also closed. But yes, yeah, so our youth, um, we uh, work with them, with their coaches to get them to dream. And we try to expose them to all different careers. So not just in the food business. So we really try to find out what's your passion, um, what is your interest, and then try to get them externships or at least connections to other fields of their interest. 
Cool. We got a couple more quick questions. Um, one of them is, what has been the strategy? This is from Louise. What has been the strategy for online fundraisers for the cafe? So we just um, did our first one um, a little over a week ago. Um, so we're learning, but um, it was really, it was a great turnout. We had like 85 people there. And um, so um, again, we're a fully youth run jazz nonprofit supper club. So the youth were the entertainment. So just like when you come in, so we had, um, we kicked it off with a couple young people that were played a couple songs. Um, and then we had a, an alumni speak as well as a current youth speak. Um, and so I was um, kind of in an interview style, had a couple of our supporters that interviewed me and the two young people. Um, and then we just opened it up for questions and then people donated um, right there on the spot. And then um, people are donating after as well as it's raising awareness for how people can, I always tell them you can dine, donate and share. All of those are super valuable. So um, we let them know that we can, um, we're selling gift cards as well as um, uh, we're going to do, we're doing curbside and then donating, obviously that's always a need. And then sharing on, um, social media is really, um, a lot of people still don't know old school exists. And so one of the ways that helps us to become more sustainable is that we use this time when people have a little more bandwidth, um, to find out about us so that when we reopen, hopefully we'll have a line out the door. Um, a couple more quick questions uh, for you. Is Old School Cafe doing delivery via the delivery apps? And um, which days are you doing meals and is it lunch or, and dinners, both of them? Yeah, great question. So right now, this is our first week of trying to see what the interest is. So we're taking um, orders through Wednesday and we're gonna be serving um, Thursday and Friday. We'll be pick up from whatever was ordered um, through now until Wednesday. Um, and it's four to 7 p.m. So just evenings, uh, late afternoon, early evening. Um, we have not done too much of the apps yet just because we've not been open you know so we're kind of um reopening to try this but we are open to seeing again it's sort of that thing if you bring everybody and nobody's ordering everybody's just kind of sitting there waiting so we're trying to kind of see what the demand is and if there's enough of an interest then we we'd be open to trying that as well uh-oh Stuart, you're on um mute uh unfortunately zoom's smarter than i am um <laughs> So uh, we have one more quick question we have for you is, um, what is your uh, recidivism rate to your program? Yeah, so um, I know it's, it's been uh, changing from year to year, but um, we're at 11% and the national average has been um, 76%. So yeah, that's, that's um, my background, just I didn't really share that. My background was I was a correction officer and that's why I started this. So that's something I'm super passionate about. I really believe that um, providing legal employment as well as mentorship and wraparound support for all of the, um, you know, all of the trauma and all the things going on in their lives is how we actually break that cycle of um, incarceration. So we're pretty proud of that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank um, you for me. Yeah. Next year, next up, we have uh, an old friend of mine, Maisha Dickerson. I've, I've known you for how long now, Maisha? Maybe 13 years? Um, she does outreach and partnership management at the Children's Council. Stuart, it's so good to see you. Hi. I know we always, it's like in real life, we just bump into each other every <laughs> <I know>. event. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so glad to be here and supporting my fellow legacy committee members and team and also like hearing about all these amazing organizations. Um, yeah, SF New Deal, I've been following you guys on social media, so really excited to see and hear from, from you directly about all the great work that you're doing. Um, but today I'm here representing Children's Council and we are a nonprofit resource number four organization celebrating our 45th year. So we've been around for a really long, long time. Um, originally founded by two moms that were just looking to help their friends and kind of neighbors and communities kind of bringing resources and um, some play groups for the families that were in their area. And then from there, they got some funding and they expanded and it really just started as like a switchboard with like a Rolodex of different childcare providers that were available and services that families could connect to. Um, and now we are obviously more digital and advanced, but 
supporting families and connecting them to the resources and services that they need. Um, as you can imagine, right now during COVID, um, childcare really is essential. It's essential for workers that are trying to keep things going, you know, for healthcare workers, for grocery store clerks, for bus operators, like you name it, like in order for them to make it to their jobs and actually be present, like they need to make sure that their children are safe and taken care of. And Children's Council really is that lifeline connecting them to those services um, and, and, and also paying for it. So making sure that it's affordable, it's accessible, and it's really safe and responsive to their needs. Um, as the schools close, like the, they, they were kind of taking care of the children um, that were in schools, but like infants and toddlers were kind of left out. So making sure like the little ones were definitely also given a space and kind of safe environments because their learning and development is just as crucial. Um, so we're really thrilled to be able to kind of provide that support, but it, it that does take a lot of work and coordination. Um, and so supporting the teachers and early educators to make sure that they have the supplies, to make sure they have food to provide for the children. Um, and they, yeah, that they have income coming in to be able to keep their doors open um, is definitely also one of our biggest um, kind of motivators to really ensure that they are protected um, in general or post uh, before COVID, San Francisco roughly had around a thousand childcare sites or um, centers, including centers and um, home-based family childcare homes. And currently we have around a hundred open, so it's very limited. And as you can imagine, that's even more people that are unemployed and without income and already kind of struggling to make their basic needs. So in collaboration with several city funders and state funding, um, we've been able to continue paying them their um, subsidy rates for providing care, even though the children aren't at their, in their homes, to make sure that they are ready when we do kind of reopen and once the shelter in place lifts. Um, and as you can imagine, that's definitely like a big relief for them. Um, Many of the childcare providers and teachers are definitely um, mostly women, women of color, um, and in communities that are typically left out. Um, lots of undocumented workers um, from in immigrant communities and mostly monolingual. So ensuring that they have access to resources and really um, providing it for them directly from a trusted source is something that we've been able to provide and um, continue during this time. Um, additionally, we're also offering virtual programming for families, which is a challenge because not many, you know, with your, you have an infant at home, it's a lot different to work from home when you're also trying to take care of a small child. So at least giving them like an hour of respite to kind of do an activity, um, take a break and a breather, to kind of just sit and connect with their children has um, definitely been super engaging and really actually like fun and um, a great opportunity for us to kind of continue building community and ensure that families aren't isolated during this time. Um, we know that it's stress for, stressful for so many folks, um, but for many families that are already stressed and on the brink of poverty, we know that continued isolation just kind of pushes them over the edge more. So providing a space for them to connect, providing them with access to resources and information, um, just letting them know what the, what's available. Like our staff are working around the clock to make sure like we know where the food pantries are, we know how to um, advise about how to um, apply for unemployment and um, just really connecting families and those that are already trusting us as their, their lifeline to be able to access those. Um, so currently that's, that is what we're working on. Our goal is to really ensure that when things do open up that childcare is available. We know that it will be a, a big need if or when, you know, the shelter in place is over. Um, in order for people to go back to work, they will need childcare. 
it will have to be safe and it will need to be accessible to them. So that is our goal. Um, and yeah, we just connect to us, find out how you can help, um, continue just listening and taking in all this great information. And um, yeah, we'll see you all on the other side. All right, thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, we got a couple questions for you. Um, one of them is, uh, do you worry about schools continuing to be closed and what kinds of, and uh, what, sorry, do you worry about schools continuing to be closed and the kids' developments being held back? And also, what do you think the city and public schools can do to get kids back on track safely? Yeah, that's definitely a big concern. And uh, yeah, as even just like the summer slide is typically a thing that happens. Um, so being mindful that like summer has been extended by eight plus months and under stressful circumstances that family and or children weren't prepared for. So we are expecting just like normal, like some trauma to kind of be a result of the shelter in place and the social distancing and like the abrupt changes and all the unknowns. Um, and studies show that that definitely has an effect on children. Um, so definitely we are trying to work together definitely with our teachers and with the child care centers, with staff um, and with various community partners to ensure that people are prepared and we're kind of thinking of what the return looks like. And at the currently just kind of reaching out to the families that we have connections to, making sure that they are connected to resources. There is a lot available, but not many people know how to access it. So just kind of putting it out there, um, connecting people, um, ensuring things are in the languages that they need it and that they're accessible. Um, so keeping it really clear and direct and kind of, yeah, just being there when people reach out. But we know that there will definitely be like, a, yeah, the no one's been through a pandemic before, but experiencing toxic stress, we know that there are um, some dramatic effects on children and their development and their learning. So we're kind of prepared for that. Um, we have another question for you here. Uh, what sorts of technologies and services are being used to support learning and development during uh, COVID-19? So kind of like everyone, we're using a lot of Zoom. Um, there's so many great um, virtual resources like by the library and so many different community partners, both locally and nationally. So ensuring that we have access to those and that if it's not translated, like we're translating them into languages that our families need. Um, and thankfully things can be accessed by the phone, um, you know, with the smartphone um, and ensuring if, we do hear of like other technologies that families can access in terms of like laptops, which were provided for the school district um, students, um, just being available and having those, those resources there. Um, yeah, so lots of virtual meetings, lots of, we have an online um, help center that kind of provides all the resources that we've been kind of collecting and vetting and making sure they're available and actually um, responding to families kind of questions and needs and being able to link them to, to those kind of in real time. Um, we know that everyone's comfortable with technology. So just being mindful, but also trying to kind of stretch the learning and, you know, everyone's kind of learning to do new things. So being supportive as we support them in learning this new technology and getting used to all these new tools. All right, we got one more quick question. Um, how many families uh, engage with your services each week during uh, the COVID shelter in place? Let's see, so that's a good question. Um, I believe our calls have definitely risen. I don't have the exact numbers, but we're all working virtually. So staff are, they typically have a caseload of about 100 families that they work with directly. We have a staff of around 120. So we've been kind of connecting with all of our families that have direct kind of contacts or a direct staff person. Um, and then I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, our food program providers, that's around 250 providers. So ensuring that they have food to provide when they're 
or since they're closed, if families can access the food through them since they've already built that connection. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have exactly the numbers, but work has not slowed down. Like we definitely have been um, reaching out and contacting and just doing as much as we can with the people that we are connected with, We're using a lot of social media and just like pushing stuff through emails um, and um, yeah, just trying to push things out as frequently as possible and in the, ch the channels that we have already set up. Uh-oh. Stuart, you need that again. <laughs> I can't again do that. <laughs> um, uh, how are you getting in touch with people uh, who are monolingual and not speaking English necessarily? Yeah, so we have staff that speak all languages, pretty well, not all languages, but Spanish, um, Cantonese, Mandarin, Tagalog, Russian, um, Vietnamese. Um, so we definitely, we are using, you know, staff are able to provide that communication themselves. And when, when needed, we translate. Um, we also have staff with a, um, ASL, ASL, so it's um, sign language capabilities. So yeah, given that we've been able to really reach a, a wide portion of um, the families that are in need, and then when need necessary, we, we do partner up with organizations that have other language supports or services available or can help us like translate. Um, how are you getting in touch with them like specifically? Like is it through newsletters or, or how do you, are you reaching the people? Oh, so mostly direct like staff contacts. So our, trans, our newsletters are translated into English and Spanish. Um, the articles and the information that's online, we're, using like the the google translate so those things can be kind of like def directly translated but the staff caseloads like if they already have a caseworker they're working with them directly they already have that language capability built in All right. great thank you so much thank you very much we have one more person on our uh, on the docket we have Mark Salazar, Executive Director of Mental Health Association, San Francisco. Hi, Mark. Hey, how are you? Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you to everyone here uh, for kind of uh, supporting everyone uh, and all the work that we've, uh, we're doing as a community. Uh, it's great to see that everyone's kind of rallying together and, you know, we're, we're always uh, in this together. So uh, that's the first thing I always want to say. Thank you all for that. Um, so. Uh, the Mental Health Association of San Francisco is a 70 plus year old organization. We provide peer-to-peer uh, -peer support, uh, education, training, and advocacy all revolved around mental health. Um, our, our support is focused on building human connections and community. Uh, we kind of work on investing in peer leadership. Uh, what that means is that our organization focuses on having peers as part of the solution and leading the solutions in mental health. Uh, our staff alone is 90% uh, peer staff. So that means they are individuals who self-identify with uh, mental health conditions or substance use uh, disorders. Um, what we try to do is we promote uh, human dignity and we recognize the unique uh, value of having uh, of individuals within the mental health spectrum uh, and that everything that we do around mental health, uh, including uh, Political advocacy is led by uh, individuals with mental health conditions. Uh, so some of the work that we do uh, is peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, basically one-on-one -on -one peer coaching uh, of individuals or peer counselors to any individual in San Francisco. Uh, you know, prior to COVID-19, we obviously did that uh, in person. Now everything has gone virtual. Um, so some of those services, we, we help them develop uh, recovery plans or uh, wellness plans. Uh, these uh, individuals, you know, we, we try to strive for non-judgmental peer support. Uh, we help them uh, try to process their feelings. Uh, we try to be a supportive presence for them. Uh, we try to encourage them to uh, develop coping skills uh, and to support them uh, when they need it. So, uh, and a lot of our staff who have lived experience uh, are peer counselors and uh, they use 
uh, their lived experience as a way to normalize kind of the emotions and then support that they are providing. Uh, another program that we have is called Solve, or Sharing Our Lives, uh, Voices and Experiences. That's an anti-stigma program. So we go out in the community, well, we used to go out in the community uh, to uh, do presentations on uh, the effects of mental health stigma and how people have um, overcome some of those challenges within the system itself. Uh, one of the uh, outgrowths of this is that we work directly with CIT, or the Crisis Intervention Team, uh, with the San Francisco uh, police department and we kind of educate them on uh, the effects of mental health stigma and how police officers approach uh, individuals uh, in the community uh, rather than just sending them straight to jail. Um, we try to teach them how to be um, supportive and understand that people with mental health conditions may need a different uh, type of service rather than, you know, incarcerating them. Uh, uh, we, an amazing program that we used to have and we kind of miss is uh, a do Santa card program. Uh, that's when we write individualized cards um, and we bring them to General uh, SF General's uh, psychiatric unit once a month and we interact with the clients there who are, uh, are inpatient. Um, you know, we, we do uh, presentations, we play board games, we bring them gifts uh, twice a year. Uh, that's one of the few things that we miss, you know, interacting with the, um, the individuals there. Uh, people forget about them, especially around COVID-19. People have kind of forgotten about people who are uh, in an inpatient setting uh, at the psychiatric unit. So we miss that program terribly and we're kind of working on how we can get back into those units, uh, respecting you know, social distancing and, and all that. So, so we're, we're working to get that going. Um, and one of the bigger programs that we have is the uh, California Peer Run Warm Line. I'm not sure if everybody heard of that. Uh, it's a statewide warm line. Uh, a warm line is different from a hotline as we try to prevent those crises from happening. Uh, our theory is, or you know, evidence shows that um, if we just give someone an outlet to speak to somebody and give them a listening ear, uh, we can prevent a lot of these crisis calls or uh, emergency services that people have to go through if they don't seek services at all. So our warm line operates 24 seven. Uh, you can call them uh, or you can chat with them uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if everyone has access to the presentation deck, uh, the information and links are there. Um, so just the impact of COVID-19 on that line is that uh, since we've gone remote on March 13th and every big uh, news event, our call volume doubles. So prior to COVID-19, we saw about 120 to 145 callers a day. It spiked to 165, uh, then to over 200 calls a day, and then recently it spiked to 300 calls per day. Um, that is volume that we cannot um, respond to. Uh, and so we are kind of on a major hiring spree. And so one of the things that we're asking today is if you could spread the word uh, that we're hiring uh, a number of peer counselors, uh, both part-time and full-time. Uh, it, it's one of the, you know, one of the silver linings is that we, we can provide the service and we can employ people remotely. Uh, and so that's one of our biggest asks here. Um, we expect to actually receive, uh, we expect it to receive about 40,000 to 50,000 calls uh, from October to June. Uh, now we're projecting over uh, 70 or 80,000 uh, calls just uh, to the end of June this year uh, because of COVID-19. Um, and as you all know, self-isolation, uh, social distancing, uh, you know, being at home all the time causes mental health distress, uh, anxiety, and, you know, all the things related to uh, uh, a recession uh, really does affect people. And so we, we expect uh, that to translate to calls uh, uh, to the warm line itself. I mean, a, a lot of things that we're seeing is kind of financial distress. A lot of people who receive stimulus checks, uh, you know, $1,200 or $2,400 wasn't enough, uh, especially in the Bay Area. Uh, and so we're seeing that uh, correspondence with or that kind of uh, conversation happening with a lot of our warm-line counselors. Um, uh, uh, especially for seniors, one of the, the biggest things there is isolation, you know, the, not having a uh, person in uh, person-to-person -person contact is one of those things that kind of deteriorates an individual mentally. So we are encouraging, um, uh, we're partnering with Friendship Line and other uh, senior focused services to kind of encourage them to utilize our warm line, utilize the Friendship Line 
uh, you know, it, it's all there. Um, and then one of the other few things that we kind of got out of this is that a lot, while our programs uh, uh, temporarily shut down because of us going remote, we have successfully brought majority of our support groups online uh, in a span of uh, two weeks. And so uh, we're doing a, a, a variety of things. Uh, we're doing adults uh, for uh, uh, on the autism spectrum, managing anxiety related to COVID-19, uh, a group for people of color. Uh, we do something called Coffee Talk on Fridays. Uh, I'm not sure if y'all watch Saturday Night Live. Uh, and our Coffee Talk is um, our staff members just sharing things about their lives, just kind of creating that community. Uh, last week, one of our staff members uh, did something on plants and how they're caring for their plants at home. Uh, another staff member did uh, a baking show for us. Um, we share our pets and any other creatures that may live with us uh, as part of Coffee Talk. So we're trying to, you know, do different things, trying to push the boundary and just uh, trying to create that community that everybody's probably missing right now. Um, uh, we also saw like an uptick in participation in those groups, which is um, both cool and weird. To us, uh, you know, we always thought person-to-person -person connection uh, is, is a great benefit, and we still believe that. But uh, I think the easiness of using virtual support uh, and just not even leaving your home uh, has actually encouraged people to participate, which we kind of are happy about. So uh, we see an uptick in kind of program uh, participation. And then in the month of May, uh, we're putting together a lineup uh, of uh, presentations, movies uh, for May's Mental Health Month. Uh, and so we're, we're getting experts, uh, including a, a panelist of psychologists, uh, uh, people of color kind of groups and all that, not groups, but presentations. So we're, we're doing that twice a week. We're, we're finalizing the schedule in a couple of days. And so we're getting that out. Um, so, I mean, I think to Glide's uh, point earlier, um, you know, one of the fortunate things about this is that we are um, in a pretty good um pretty good position where we are not actively uh you know seeking funding uh, we are more of trying to find ways to support other organizations as well as the community um, you know we're, we're doing our best in hiring and meeting the needs we're actually missing a significant number of callers or calls and chats because of our staffing uh, capacity so we're, we're missing about you know 20 to 30 percent uh, of any contact that we get on a daily basis. And that's significant. Um, people can call us and leave us a voicemail or send us an email. We will try to call back. Uh, but our, our goal is to kind of answer them on the spot. Um, so like, uh, like I was saying earlier, our main goal today is kind of asking you all to spread the word about the warm line uh, and also spread the word about our kind of our spree, our hiring spree, uh, we need uh, to support the both San Francisco and the entire state of California with their mental health. Uh, and we can only do that if we have enough staff uh, on board. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, first one goes back to your hiring. Um, do you have to have a therapy background or can uh, just anybody be there to help out? Um, you don't necessarily need a uh, uh, therapy background. Uh, what we ask is that you have to be comfortable uh, disclosing uh, that you have a mental health uh, condition, and that's one of the prerequisites because uh, we believe that uh, being able to relate to somebody uh, improves um, them opening up and, and accepting that help. Uh, so that's one of the, the first few requirements that we have. And additionally, a lot of the counselors uh, that we do hire uh, we'll go through an extensive training uh, put on by our staff. Uh, it's it, it's two weeks or so of just intensive training um, uh, to become a counselor. Um, outside of medical support, like therapists and psychologists, uh, what methods have been most effective in helping people de-stress during this insane, stressful time? Um, so we've been working with um, a number of experts, and so we what we tell. Uh, people to do is just to create community i'm not create, but um kind of develop home-based routines and activities i'm pretty sure everybody sees this on social media TikTok. just engage everybody as much as you can well, one of the biggest issues is people are afraid to reach out so we encourage people to reach out um but if you know if you 
don't want to do that, um, we we ask you know if you can respect social distancing guidelines, but go get a fresh walk, uh, go outside to uncrowded areas. Uh, we encourage people to journal if they can, um, do arts and crafts, be a little kid, go paint something, color a book. I don't know. Um, try to exercise, and, and some of us may have you know be challenged around that, but you know try to find some form of movement and exercise, uh, find a hobby, do origami, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, learn a new skill. There's a bunch of online classes. I think Harvard opened up some of their courses. MIT has opened courses. There's a um, uh, edX has opened up courses as well. So there's a lot of ways that you can learn a new skill or just gain new knowledge, read books. We have a staff member who's actually on this uh, this presentation right now who's read a number of books using her kindle uh, so we encourage you to go to read books um, you know and and uh, if you can create a community a lot of things uh, can this is a, a marathon not a sprint so if you can create a community to get you through this uh, we highly encourage that you're mute Stuart. Ah, hi 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 i keep doing that i'm not used to i'm usually like get overwhelmed by these big things and like I'm actually quiet for once, uh, but now I'm supposed to talk, so here I am. Um, so I don't know about you all, but I'm, I'm really um, inspired and excited to be a Bay Area person right now. Um, the Bay Area never ceases to amaze me and, and always continue to, continues to show up for, for everybody. I think that's part of our values as, as people in the Bay Area. And uh, I wanna thank you all for doing what you do. And I think everybody on this call is also similarly inspired and um, stoked to, to be here and to, and to be around what you're doing. And hopefully what you do here, like everything happens, it starts here, gets spread to other places. Uh, Cause it's the Bay, it's what happens. Um, we, we got, a, I got some questions from everybody um, to go over. Um, in the meantime, if you have any more questions, send it in the chat. Um, cool. Um, and uh, let's see here, here's a couple questions. This is for, um, for all the panelists. Do, uh, do any of your organizations have in-person volunteer opportunities at the moment? We do. <laughs> um, we have some of those. So uh, we still do need some people to make deliveries from restaurants to partner sites. We're, we're partnering actually with Cruise Automation that does self-driving cars and they're doing the bulk of our deliveries, which has been great. Um, because then we're not struggling all the time to fill volunteer slots, but we do still have volunteer needs come up there and around delivering PPE um, to our partner restaurants and partner sites. Additionally, um, we have some need, or I think we'll have some need. Um, we're, we're seeing sort of other food programs pop up, but I think for everybody, the, the pain point is like delivery. And so for, for like, we're, we're trying, we have a wait list of, of like many thousands of meals right now. And so as we're hearing about other orgs that are providing food, but maybe can't provide the delivery part, we're sort of trying to like fill those slots with, with delivery people. So if you're interested, please pop on over to our website, sfnewdeal.org and email us. Teresa? Ours is very minimal right now um, because we're not doing a whole lot, but um, this don't laugh. But so um, our theme is 1920s speakeasy. So our boys wear senders. <laughs> and so we have several pants that are in need of buttons <laughs> being sewed on the suspenders. <laughs> I think we have like uh, 12 pair that are missing. So, uh, so we have like silly things like that. And then we're also, we're using this time um, for some of our, our staff and just think some of the um, deep organizing and getting t-shirts packaged and, you know, cause we do t-shirts for our youth as well as uh, we sell them. So we've got like very minimal, but those are some of the kind of, you know, I'll sit and watch a show and sew buttons or um, package t-shirts and things like that. So if anything you're interested, let me know. Anybody else? I have another one, actually. If you're interested <laughs> in volunteering in person, um, so the SF African American Faith Based Coalition, which is one of our community partners, um, on Saturdays, they're doing this thing where um, at one of our restaurants, um, they're hosting these events where people are making grocery bags that are then being distributed um, through the faith based community and other groups as well. So if you're interested in doing that um, or interested in other in-person volunteer opportunities, you can sign up at Together SF 
.org, I think. Um, they're this organization that's just kind of gathering volunteers to deploy for various things. Um, or you can email us on our site. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Teresa again? What's that? Sorry, I thought of one other thing. Um, I, you had asked about them, um, what they go on to do at other careers. So we do have, um, we have um, some guest speaker spots to share about different careers, but it's via Zoom. So it's not in person. It's very limited in person, but if you'd be interested in sharing about your career, kind of just for exposure for like 15 minutes, we have um, slots like that. It's fun for them to hear um, on actually on our um, the fundraising call we did one of the young ladies said how she wanted to be a neurosurgeon and so one of the people on um, one of the donors that had come to the fundraiser said I work with neurosurgeons I'd be happy to put her in touch so she can have that conversation so there's just so many you know that's that's what I love about our community and being able to connect our youth to their dreams and goals awesome uh, we got a couple more questions. We have one for uh, for John from Glide. Um, the question is: Is there a way that we can help advocate, and uh, who can we call to help get people who need shelter into hotels? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in terms of advocating, um, the Glide has a number of resources on any given day that update folks about the city's policies, about Glide's work, featuring some of our clients um, right now. If you want information that's particularly geared towards uh, COVID and the COVID interventions that we are offering, you can literally just go to uh, www.glide.org slash COVID-19. I'm still put it in the channel on that. Um, and that'll give you live updates, not only on what we're doing, but some of the partnerships we're having with community organizations, as well as um, updates as live as we can get them out there as to how the city's policies are changing um, the sort of ebb and flow of resources to the homeless population. Uh, in terms of resources for getting homeless individuals into shelters and the various hotel programs, um, it's very piecemeal for right now. If you have access to the Glide community and you're working with a client, I encourage you to refer them to our walk-in center, um, which among many other things offers navigation services, which can get individuals in a more seamless fashion to the different shelter opportunities, which are available now. Um, so they can be contacted again through our website, looking for the walk-in center services um, or by contacting me or anybody on our team. All right, and uh, we have a question for Lenore. Um, how do you bring on new restaurant partners and do you expect to continue working with them beyond the COVID context? Okay, so yeah, when we first started, we wanted to be able to just like provide regular support on an ongoing basis um, to our restaurants. Our program's kind of expensive to run. It's costing us about 200K for a while. The city was also putting in 100K for, um, from the Human Rights Commission. So like 300K a week, uh, so that's a lot. <laughs> We're very actively trying to fundraise and get fun and, and like from private sources and then also, um, you know, trying to get FEMA dollars to support what we're doing. Um, but we have a wait list already of over 100 restaurants. So um, the main way we recruited restaurants at the beginning was just sort of reaching out to people in our network and then working with some consultants who work in the Fillmore and in Bayview to try to get some of those restaurants on board. We reached out to La Cocina at that time, actually, most of their bricks and mortar plate, uh, establishments were um, had decided to like close for the short term. Um, and so the slots kind of filled up. We have like 43 restaurants that we're giving 8K a week to, um, and we have this huge wait list. So we actually like kind of closed the wait list to anyone else because we don't want people to have false hope. Um, but we have applied to a bunch of RFQs. And so if we're getting um, funding for more meals, we can obviously bring on more restaurants. Um, in terms of how long we're planning to work with people, we are committed to our current restaurants um, through end of May. And then I think after that, um, we're looking, trying to figure out what we're gonna need to do for like longer term support. I think um, obviously a lot of small businesses are gonna need help well beyond the end of the shelter in place, um, just as like the new way of dining at a restaurant is gonna be very different than it used to be. So just in terms of like capacity and even like the customer's interest in kind of going out and being in close proximity to other people, I think, um, 
I think like the industry will definitely be affected for in the range of like one to two years, perhaps two to three years. So I think people will need to find ways to um, get other types of support. So whether that means supporting restaurants in like sort of having a Patreon model where people subscribe um, to support restaurants that they want to exist, like you would with a bookstore or with like City Arts and Lectures um, and become a member or finding ways to help some businesses pivot to becoming more content creators or having um, con consumer packaged goods products that they can get out to people through other channels. Um, we're sort of exploring different ways to help our businesses longer term. Um, but depending on funding, I mean, we're, we're expecting for the food need to definitely persist for a really long time. Um, like obviously food insecurity was a problem well before the COVID-19 crisis. And this has just exacerbated the, the existing situation. Um, and definitely until the end of the, the summer when kids would go back to school, I think we're gonna see like a heightened need for additional food in our community. Um, so yeah, we're, we're exploring sort of a lot of different ways to support both our businesses and the community. And we'd like to, I mean, ideally it'd be great to find, to sort of connect with people in government and business to like find a longer term solution to food insecurity. Um, I think just, just seeing like the support that's come together in the last month, it's made me feel inspired about what we should like expect from ourselves and um, like trying to create a new system that addresses people's needs more quickly. Awesome. Uh, here's a question for all the presenters tonight. Uh, do you feel that uh, many people are falling through the cracks during this virus and pandemic? Um, I'll just start that from our perspective. That's certainly true. Uh, as I was speaking about in my original piece, shelter was really one of the first things to go and it's an unprecedented problem. So everyone was sort of looking at everyone else to offer the solution to the problem and each and every institution, including the city, struggled to do that. And that's why it took so long. Um, so yeah, absolutely. People are falling through the cracks. Um, not that I'm advocating walking around the downtown area, but if for some reason you've seen the Tenderloin right now, it looks exactly like it does on any other day. Um, it's a privilege to shelter in place, not um, just a struggle. And many of these individuals, even if they're fully aware of the regulations, don't possess any of the resources to abide by them. And that's extraordinarily difficult. So each and everything that we can do to try and lift up our most vulnerable is going to be more important now than it ever has been really before. Cool. Teresa? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think that especially when we're dealing with issues of, um, you know, poverty and um, food insecurity uh, and just a, a lot of, trauma at home, it just kind of exacerbates, you know, because so for example, one of our young ladies um, getting kicked out of the house, well now the wait list, like to try to find her other housing, it's like, it was already hard before for our youth that were um, homeless and now it feels impossible. So, so yeah, I think it's just, um, everything is, is put a little just extra um, challenges and pressures on it. Um, so yes, I think absolutely. But I also feel super encouraged about things like this. I feel like I've been seeing everybody being really creative um, and caring to say, you know, I mean, I'm getting calls out of the blue, like, how can we help? Like we, you know, and I just, so as much as there is uh, even harder challenges than what we already had. I do feel like um, people are stepping up and really wanting to help. So I'm really encouraged by that. Cool. Uh, and I'll just tack on what, yeah, I definitely kind of echoing what John and Teresa have mentioned. Yeah, we know that people are falling in, in, in the cracks and children that are, were already isolated, but had like some, a place to go with school. They're now kind of just stuck in their home. So unable to really provide them with some type of learning or fun or some, and even just the parents give them like a break to kind of work or just breathe. And um, we know that those stressors are really hard on a lot of people. So we do anticipate and yeah, we know that people are struggling. Um. I've got a note here from uh, Gail, uh, and she wants uh, the folks who work in the nonprofit sector to know that um, at, over where she's at at TechSoup, they have a whole suite of um, 
tools to help support nonprofits during the COVID pandemic. So check them out at TechSoup. Uh, we got one more uh, question. Uh, this is a great way to kind of tie it all together. Um, we'd like every presenter to let them know the single most important thing that people can do to support the organization right now. And uh, can everybody let them know where they can go to donate? So I'd like, you know, oh, including Broke Ash Stewart. Uh, thank you, thank you, ah, yes. Um, uh, yeah, if everybody could like, you know, I'll, I'll let you all go in whatever order you'd like to uh, tell us how people can support. And then in the group chat, if you could put your, your link, I'll put my Patreon in there. And if you all could put your link to where people can donate and get involved. Um, who wants to go first? Lenore, I'll let you go first. Nope, maybe Lenore's frozen. All right, how about Mark? Oh, yeah, I mean, one of the most important things people could do is help us increase the capacity of our warm line. Um, you know, like what we were saying earlier, uh, people are falling through the cracks. We know there's going to be a rash of suicide attempts or probably successful suicide attempts. Uh, so we kind of, we want to make sure that we're there for everybody. So that's the one ask. And if you are, if you can donate, um, you know, mentalhealthsf.org, uh, slash donate is a great place uh, to kind of support our agency, but I would encourage you to also support the others. Um, you know, we, we're not strapped for cash and I, I would encourage you to support all the other organizations as well. All right, uh, Maisha, you want to go? Sure, I will say just follow us on social media, sign up for a newsletter. Um, we are also have lots of support in terms of funding. So I would, yeah, give to the S of New Dillon, <laughs> the mental health, like give, yeah. Just keep giving, give as much as you can. All right, Lenore, you're back, I think. Back, I got kicked off, but I'm, I'm back. Um, our biggest bottleneck right now is just money, right? We have like a ton of people on our wait list and a ton of restaurants that want to participate and we just like don't have enough funds to be able to actually support people and feel confident that we're not going to like run out of money in two weeks. Um, so we're just really actively trying to fundraise. If anyone has connections to like corporate sponsors who might be interested in participating. Um, and if you can't donate, um, just like following us on Instagram and Twitter and helping us amplify our voice. I do think just like getting the word out um, so that more, even, even like small donations help. Uh, we did this calculation at the beginning of, um, like six weeks ago and realized that if every San Francisco, if, if half of San Francisco gave four bucks, we would actually have enough money to feed people through the end of May, everyone on our list plus the wait list. So just trying to really mobilize people to give whatever you can, even if that's like five dollars. And uh, I'll put our website on the link thing. Great. That reminds me, uh, to all the, the folks on here, the nonprofit workers, uh, feel free to reach out to me after this. Uh, um, and if I can help you get the word out, because I'm sure I could help in some way or another about what you're doing. Uh, let's see here. Um, who, uh, John, would you like to go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, earlier, I linked the COVID page for Glide. That's the best place for news and to learn about the best things you can signal boost. Uh, I've also donated or uh, added here, glide.org slash donate. Um, you know, people are in varying situations right now. There, You don't everyone gives in their own way what they're capable of. So whether it's dollars, whether it's support, whether it's product, I think um, the best thing that people can do right now is incorporate personal philanthropy into their routine. I think I've heard lots of really creative and adorable ways of it where somebody's like, oh, maybe usually right now I'd be buying my morning cup of coffee. Instead, I'm gonna donate $3.50 to whatever my organization of choice is. Or instead of you know ordering my sandwich on Postmates, I'm gonna donate a meal to a local kitchen or shelter or something like that. So find the cause that resonates with you. Any of these organizations, their impact is charitable and you'll be making a great difference. All right, and Teresa, you're up. Thank you. Um, I would love it, just to see um, by show of hands, who's ever heard of Old School Cafe before? Mm. Oh, this is, Emily, is this your doing? <laughs> That's awesome. That's so encouraging. And Stuart, thank you. So what we hear a lot is that Old School Cafe is like the best kept secret. So we've been open as a full youth run jazz supper club um, 
uh, for eight years, but we still don't have a full house a lot because people will come and say, I've, this is the first time I've ever heard about it. Um, so obviously donations are huge because that's going to help us um, survive and, and keep going. But we really would love um, helping spread the awareness. I mean, San Francisco is not that big. It's kind of like a small town, little, you know, big city. And so and we know it's really about person to person. So we've been trying to get whether it's some influencers, some celebrities, um, just to kind of know and, um, you know, and start to talk about us, you know, post about us because we would love once we do open, we're really trying to be hopeful that once this passes, we need to have a full house um, as full as we're allowed to have it right <laughs> six feet apart. Um, but it really does that long term success is how do we utilize this time that people are home that they have some space um, to find out about us. So any help in, um, you know, and obviously, you know, um, ordering when we do the curbside pickup too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. Before you take off, um, make sure you check out the links in the chat. And I'm going to pass off to Paloma right now, who's going to close this all out. Thanks for uh, putting up with me for a little while. Hi, everybody. My name is Paloma. I'm the Glide Legacy Committee co-chair along with Chris. Um, I'm not going to keep you too long because I know it's it's been a long day for everybody. Um, but as Chris said earlier, these are unusual and uncertain times. And I know how you spend your time is super important. So I just want to send an immense thank you for all of our speakers. We're super honored that you took some space to, to inform us and educate us about your personal journey through the pandemic and how you're responding to the needs of your staff and the needs of our community, especially when you yourself you know, might be experiencing incredible amount of hardship. Um, I also want to thank our phenomenal moderator, Stuart, um, who's been, as Chris said, a very passionate supporter of our work here at Glide and just generally a phenomenal uh, community organizer and advocate on all of the issues that we value here um, on the committee. And so this has been our very first digital event. So thank you for uh, coming along with us on this journey. Uh, thank you to Chris and Lucy and the rest of the LC for helping to get this baby out the door. Uh, quickly before everybody goes, uh, we want to continue this conversation. So please follow us, um, the Legacy Committee, on Instagram at Glide SF Legacy um, and Facebook uh, as the Glide Legacy Network. Um, we'll be developing more virtual events in the future. And specifically, we want to invite everybody to the next event that we're going to be hosting. It's going to be called Monday Movie Night. It's It'll be a multi-week series of documentary shorts and discussions. Um, it's an opportunity to learn more about the issues that Clyde addresses with its programs and services. And our hope is that each week we'll screen a film that covers a topic that corresponds to a Clyde program um, and then host a discussion with members of that team um, afterwards. Uh, it was inspired by the excitement around our biannual social Justice Film Festival, which I know everybody really loves. So we're excited to try this new format and provide a new venue to check out these films. Um, if you have any questions and want to reach out to us or speak to us about the Legacy Committee, you can reach out to us at youngprofessionals.glide.org. Um, we'll also be following up with everybody here with information and donation links, um, calls to action about from all of the speakers tonight. So if you don't catch all the information in the chat, we will be following up. So don't worry about that. And so on behalf of the Legacy Committee, thank you for sharing this space with us and we wish you a continued health and wellness and a ton of Glide radical love. So stay safe, everybody.